shock the system. Welcome to Dank Discussions with your host, Calican CEO Maynard Breslow. In each episode, you'll learn from the trailblazers, leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers in the ever moving, ever growing cannabis industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dank Discussions. Today, we're joined by Dwayne Madden. Dwayne is the owner of Hemp House of Chattanooga. Thanks for joining us today, Dwayne. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you uh, taking the time. No, the pleasure is on mine. You know, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, a lot of great things going on in Tennessee. And, um, you know, I w- want to talk about that. You know, it's, it's always important for me to talk, uh, you know, people from across the states and even in, in other countries. Obviously, we cover uh, different countries as well. But uh, just kind of hear what's going on because everybody has a different view. Every every single state and region has different, um, you know, different stigmas or different ideas, different legislation, different regulation going on. Um, and I can't be everywhere, and not everybody can be everywhere. So it's important to talk about that. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm really happy to, to, to jump on with you. Um, and so you're in Tennessee, Chattanooga. Yeah, Chattanooga, Tennessee. We're right above the uh, Georgia state line, so southeast area of the state. Um, very hot, very humid. Um, weird conditions for growing uh, hemp that's accustomed for growing in uh, northern west territories and stuff like that. But we're learning how to do it, and um, we're. I think Tennessee is going to play a big part in the uh, upcoming hemp industry. Um, I think we're a big part in the current hemp industry, but I think as the years move on, um, some of our farmers that uh, are just, you know, good old boys that have been growing for, for many years um, and know how to work that dirt and, and make that soil do things. Um, I think we're going to be some of the top contenders in the hemp industry here before too long. Yeah, for sure. And we're definitely going to talk about, you know, what separates Tennessee. I think uh, you guys have a big picture kind of view on, uh, on the plan in general. And, um, yeah. you know, you mentioned the old, these, these old farmers. We just had on uh, Harold Jarbo, you know, over there, Tennessee homegrown. Uh, he's a great guy, yep. the old hemp farmer. Uh, he's a, he's an amazing guy. We carry their product line. Um, he's been with me since day one. Um, he was one of the first people that I talked to in the Tennessee hemp area as far as getting to know about CBD and products. So uh, super knowledgeable guy and glad to glad to know him for sure. No, definitely. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's an OG and we're able to cover his story and he was able to bring so much knowledge value about the, uh, the you know, growing in general, you know, between cannabis, hemp. Uh, you know, different states, and now he's there in Tennessee. But I want, I want to hear your story as well. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Point, tell, tell me your story. You know, your relationship with cannabis. Um, you know, going all the way back, and uh, and what's led to to you being here with the Hemp House, and then we'll talk about more about uh, Tennessee in general. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, man, I guess like everybody else or a lot of folks in the uh, cannabis industry, mine started uh, way back as a, as a young boy. Um, you know, when I first started smoking around 15 or 16 for self-medication, um, having some issues at school and whatnot, like everybody else. Well, then I started learning about um, endangered species, plants, animals, just stuff that, about the, the environment. And then I stumbled across hemp. Um, and, um, you know, the, the emperor wears no clothes was a book that, um, had a, a huge direction in which way my life was going to go. And so, um, I've been, uh, been on the hemp scene for, for quite a while. I always considered myself a cannabis advocate been in uh, multiple normal groups and organizations. And, um, you know, always was super happy, uh, back in 2014 when Tennessee, um, started their, um, hemp program because I was ready to move to a legal state, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, and then, um, then I attended some, uh, a hemp history week meeting, uh, that we have every year at it. It's this year will be our, well, this year would have been our fifth year. Um, and so I, I attended and met, that was where I first met Harold and, uh, many other hemp farmers and realized that there were no retail outlets for their CBD products. And, um, so we opened hemp house in October of 2017 um, been running strong since then. We've now got three locations in the Chattanooga area and, uh, we, we support local Tennessee farmers. We, um, we're not nothing against anybody, but we're not big on brokers and sales guys. We go directly to the farmers that are growing and processing at their sale. Um, and those are the people we make the connections with. And I feel like, you know, all my, all of our Vendors, farmers, whatever term you want to call it. I mean, their first name basis. We have each other's cell phone numbers. We hang out when we see each other. 
Um, and so we're just, we're really tightened in and, and, and the relationships that we built have been absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's so important. You know, we talk about the cannabis community in general, you know, how close knit that is as well. But, you know, like you said, you mentioned the brokers, all these different metal men, different uh, hands that, that go through. And all it does is, uh, you know, really just places the burden a lot on, uh, on the consumer in different ways, whether it's price or with quality, so many different things. Um, that, that's just uh, unnecessary, obviously. And you mentioned you, br you, you brushed over something really quickly there, you know, going back to your story, because I think it's so important. Um, you know, you mentioned about, um, you know, self-medication, right? I mean, I've documented on this podcast and it's well known, right? I mean, I've been smoking since I was 15, 16 as well. You know, ADHD, uh, yeah. same thing, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, being good with school, you know, getting good grades, but uh, just not wanting to be on uh, medication anymore, that kind of stuff. And, you know, Steve D'Angelo talks about, you know, we talk about recreation and everything like that. And uh, people, you know, they want to get into medical, recreational. And D'Angelo says, you know, it's uh, all, all, all cannabis use is a form of uh, medication one way medication. or another. So, uh, so t tell me a little bit more. You brushed over real quickly. You know, what is it exactly that you felt, um, you know, that you were getting, that you, that you lacked? I mean, I guess now it's, looking back, we probably didn't have that awareness at the time so much. But now looking back, we're able to um, kind of uh, dig a little deeper. So what was going on with you in school and, and how was that able to help you? I, well, so um, very, very similar to what you just said, your story. Your story um, very great academically. Never had a problem with, with school grades, just more of a boredom issue and um, kind of a defiant child, you know, mm -hmm. not really um, lacking uh, authority too much. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was about 14, and if mm -hmm. I remember, I was one of the first kids in my town that was prescribed Adderall, mm -hmm. and I mean, it was it was a horrible drug, you know, I mm -hmm. didn't like it immediately. Um, every other pill that they gave me kind of had the similar, very, very same effects as the Adderall did, um, and eventually I quit taking it, and I just, you know, I smoked marijuana, and, um, you know, Probably, you know, there's a lot of uh, studies on using it at a, at a young age, that kind of, the way that I was. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it would have been a lot better used um, under some kind of guidance um, rather than just grabbing some swag bags and smoking at the bus stop and, you know, um, hitting one on the way home. But um, that's what we had to do. And that's yeah. what got me through um, and, you know, got me to, to be able to cope with, uh, with, with handling school and, and other issues in my life. And at some point, I guess about the age of 16, my mom realized where I was and what was going on. And, um, she pretty much supported what I was doing. Mm. Um, and, and didn't, you know, she, you know, she wasn't out buying me bags or nothing, but she definitely understood what I was doing and gave me a safe place to medicate so that I didn't have to worry about getting in trouble. Um, because, you know, we would sneak off and smoke at school and wherever we could. And, uh, you know, mom would let me do that. So I didn't have to you know, risk getting in trouble at school or at a different place. So, um, but yeah, um, and I think it's something that, um, you know, we see now we have a lot of parents using um, various um, hemp products for children. And I think it's, um, I think it's kind of paving that way. And I, I think that we will start to see um, a lot more uses of cannabinoids, maybe not necessarily super high THC, um, but different cannabinoids used in um, in our youth and adolescent and some of these and, and remove some of these pills um, because, you know, I, I, my family, my sister was the same way. She's, uh, you know, her, she had to have uh, teeth removed and stuff like that because uh -huh. these medications that she was on. I mean, it's, you know, nothing comes from uh, from taking a handful of pills every day that I no, think of. No, definitely. And you, you bring up such a, you know, such a valid point. And, um, you know, in terms of, you know, looking at it from an outside point of view, right? I mean, you know, is it good to give kids, you know, bud to smoke? Probably not, right? In, in terms of, you know, so, right. but, but there is no guidance, right? I mean, the fact of the matter is that we were looking for something and, uh, you know, inherently, you know, we're, it was stigmatized and we're deemed, you know, bad kids or potheads, stoners, that kind of thing, when really we're mm -hmm. looking for relief and there was really no, no guidance out there. There's no one else, you know, other than, you know, your, your mom supporting and say, okay, cool, using the control environment um, and realizing that you're getting something out of it. And uh, now, you know, we see, you know, like you said, you know, the THC was probably the least of it, you know, uh, who doesn't want to get high, you know what yeah. I mean? But, uh, but at the same time, you know, where there was the can of other cannabinoids, obviously, that we that we're looking for um, that, um, but that, that was, that was really what we're seeking, you know, and yep. that we were getting relief from um, at that time. So um, it, it is really interesting to, to see um, how 
how it affected us, how it played a big part in us and in our development, um, and you know, help, helped us, I guess, to succeed and get where we're at. Um, you know, do you, um, I don't know, how, how has it been now? Uh, do you still use it for that? Um, you know, for, I do. For um, I'm, I'm, I medicate daily. Um, it is something that, um, but I, I, I have, I have figured out that I can over medicate um, pretty quickly early in the morning sometimes. Um, but no, I do. And it's something that helps me, you know, stay driven and stay focused. Um, it does seem to help me put my thoughts together. Um, you know, I, I still enjoy uh, a cup of coffee and a bowl every morning out back by my plants and just hanging out. And, um, you know, like I said, that's where my thoughts come together for the day. Um, and that's just how I've learned to process things. And, um, and I, you know, still to this day, I'm not on any prescription medications. I never have been. And I contribute that to cannabis in its various, various forms. Um, you know, like you said, as, as a child, probably smoking is not the uh, most healthiest way. But I'm sure as a 14, 15 year old boy, a 25 milligram CBD gummy would have worked wonders for me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, had I had that available. Um, you know, or maybe even other cannabinoids that we're learning more about. Um, you know, we're, we're jumping into CBG and CBN here. I know we're, you know, those are uh, two of the, the other cannabinoids that are becoming more, more known and isolated and being worked with a little bit more. And I'm excited to see where these go. Um, because, you know, if, if we can remove that stigma, which the stigma is the psychoactive properties. And like you said, I enjoy a good buzz like everybody else. But if we're talking about helping, you know, adolescents and youth, and if we can kind of isolate other cannabinoids and maybe even bring back a bunch of minors, um, and, and produce products that are helping some of these kids get in and, and stay focused and stay calm. Um, we've, uh, we found our way into our local autism community and man, that has just been mm. an amazing thing that I didn't see coming. Um, we kind of set up for the first time at one of their events, um, just as a vendor with little research and knowledge. And I'll tell you that community, you know, they're, they're the ones that taught me and it was awesome. And, We've helped a lot of families. I mean, we, 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 we talk to them constantly, and there are a lot of them that have been able to reduce medications. Some have been able to get off medications. Um, and it's, it's just been amazing to see those kind of things as we move forward um, and introduce cannabis to other communities that wouldn't normally um, be receptive to it, you know. Um, and we've got um, stories coming from out west, you know, um, where there's a little bit more progressiveness and they're, they're, they're documenting some of these children. And that's what's making some of the parents here more open to trying it with their children. So um, I, I think it's a beautiful thing, man. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. You know, the autistic community, you know, people, people who have uh, parents who have autistic children, um, really bringing a lot of this to the forefront, you know, and for so many reasons, you know, we've, had, we've covered it on, on this podcast as well. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I think something that separates, you know, ADHD, autism, and then, you know, even going as, as far as, you know, epilepsy and, and other things that people are dealing with seizures. Um, I think it's the level of desperation and the level of need you know, we talk, we look at ourselves and with ADHD and, uh, you know, maybe we were deemed as, uh, you know, having ants in our pants or being disruptive or, uh, you know, being troublemakers in class, everything else, else like that and giving our parents flack and getting in trouble in school. But it's a lot different than, you know, what a lot of parents are dealing with, uh, you know, with, with children on the spectrum, various levels on the spectrum. Um, and just like, parents not having anywhere to, to, to turn, right? It's like, right. it's, you know, here in ADHD, you know, you have this alternative, okay, cool, just shove some pills in them and uh, he'll sit there and he may not sleep much at night, he may not eat much and he may have other issues going on, but at least he's not gonna give his, his teachers any problems. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? And, uh, I but, you know, but these parents, you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's, uh, first of all, it's, it's uh, you know, it's really tough to see um, what some of the parents are going through but it also gives so much hope to see what, uh, what, what people are able to do. And, you know, obviously, you know, uh, needing more research and we need more research in, in all these areas. But this is something that we're seeing that the, the parents are really um, taking the bull by the horns and saying, you know what, I have nowhere else to turn. What the hell does it matter anyways? You know what I mean? A, I mean yeah. the, kid's, the kid's nonverbal or he's violent or, or other things. He's hurting himself. And, um, and I've We've seen you know, all that. It's, it's, it's really tough. And, uh, but we're seeing the, 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 the changes going on too. And it's something that, you know, people come and I think that's one of the things that turned the stigma a lot. Um, you know, people who, uh, you know, unfortunately, like I said, end of life as well. People saying, Oh man, I wish I'd known about this before. Uh, but the autism 
you know, that's really bringing a lot to the forefront and saying, no, like, uh, we can help people with this. Um, it's not just, uh, especially in states, you know, more conservative states like Tennessee, where, where maybe uh, cannabis in general looked as like, oh, what, you want to get high, this and that, the other thing is like, no, like, you don't understand the power of the cannabinoids and the plant in itself. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. No, it is. Um, you, you, you nailed it right there. And it's, um, that's probably one of the best parts of, of the thing that I do. My job is, is, you know, talking to these families and, and, and you're right. I mean, most of them are at that, that last resort and, and it, it's sad that they, that, it, that cannabis is the last resort, mm -hmm. you know, um, but that's where they're at with it and that's okay. And they made it here. And, you know, the ones that are seeing, um, you know, progression and seeing um, improvements. I mean, it's, it's great to hear them. I mean, mothers call and crying and telling you how, you know, good their kids doing in school now. And I mean, it's just, it's great. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's really has been. And, um, and we've had kids, you know, I had a cousin um, um, and her, her five-year-old daughter was having uh, severe stomach issues from a um, undiagnosed uh, mono. And basically her, her nerve endings in her stomach were raw and I sent her a bunch of CBD and they are super conservative and this was their last resort. And, um, and I mean, after a, a week or two of using CBD, she was able to completely go back to eating food. Like it was a, a, a 360 degree wow. turnaround from wow. this child. Um, and, and that was amazing. And she doesn't even have to, it's, it's even something that she's not having to use CBD continuously to manage. It just, it, it was able to help her out. And she went through this for over a year. Um, with wow. nothing helping, um, taking all wow. kinds of different drugs for it. And, you know, she just couldn't eat because the nerve endings were, were irritated. And for wow. whatever reason, you know, this, this how, and she's, she's doing great, man. This was, this was a year and a half ago and, and, and not a single problem since, you know, and, and those kind of stories are, they're all over the place. We're a small little town in Tennessee. And if we're doing things like that here, I can only imagine what's being done all over the, the United States and world. I mean, it's, uh, it's a movement and it's happening. It's um, probably not as fast as some of us want to see, um, but I think it is. And I think these, these communities, these families with, with the children, they're the ones that are leading it because that's what people are looking at is, mm -hmm. is if it can help a child and it's, it's safe and they're, you know, the parents feel it's okay. Um, but they're also the ones fighting the, um, the strongest struggle against our legislating when they get turned down um, yeah. for different stuff. You know, those are the ones where you see it get shot down and you just see the heartbreak in the family's eyes. Um, and it's, we see it time and time again here in Tennessee. Um, you know, they've given us hemp and CBD and I think they feel like we should be content with that. And, and that's what we've got for now. And, you know, I don't see that happening or changing anytime in the next, you know, couple of years, um, for sure. So, um, and that, that's a struggle for these families. Yeah, no, definitely. And, um, and you bring up, you know, another point, you know, we always talk about, you know, me being a Cali boy and all that stuff, you know, having a different kind of view on cannabis and the community and just the way it's viewed. Um, but you brought up there, you know, how this family, they were even scared after everything they've been through still, and it was the last resort, right? So talk to me a little bit, you know, stigma is a, a, you know, something that we just always comes up, obviously. I'm um, talking to you about the stigma that, that you guys have there in, in Tennessee, because it, it's different everywhere, right? I mean, some people, some states, the most conservative states are sometimes the most, uh, you know, pro CBD and, and hemp. And, um, and so it's always interesting to see, um, you know, how, where each kind of community, each state kind of falls. Where do you guys, where do you, uh, what do you see there in your experience there in Tennessee? I mean, you know, obviously the, the communities I travel in are, are very pro uh, mm -hmm. cannabis, but, um, but it's for some reason, you know, our, our, we are not a ballot state. So we as, as Tennessee voters never get to vote on issues. And us being a conservative state, um, all of our representatives that do vote on the issues are super conservative and um, in most cases pretty old and set in their ways and not really open to anything else. Um, it took a lot of fighting um, to get CBD and hemp laws passed um, in Tennessee. And, you know, this was in... 2014, um, where we were fighting to get hemp, and I think Colorado was legalizing THC, you know, for recreational use. Uh -huh. um, so it's it's um, it's frustrating to see it from that end, to see all the progression around us. Um, but yeah, it's, and that's how it's looked on. I mean, we have customers still to this day, and and most of them are 60 plus, but they come in and they say, I don't want anything that's marijuana. Uh -huh. You know, I, don't, I I I've heard about this, but as long as I, I can't take it if it's marijuana. And, and we do a lot of education. We explain to them it's all cannabis, you know, um, THC and CBD are cannabinoids. We try to explain to them about the, 
the term marijuana and, um, and you know, how all of it is the same plant. It's just grown a little differently, uh, grown for very different, you know, different strains for different things, different cannabinoids. And, and a lot of them become more open-minded to that. Um, and they see it, but they don't, they're dead set. They are still in that reefer madness mindset. Uh-huh. And they absolutely think that being stoned or high off THC, um, is, 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 you know, going to just ruin their lives. I mean, they don't even want THC in their topicals. It's, it's kind of interesting sometimes when they, they, you know, make sure that the topicals are isolate only because they don't want that THC to get into their, their bloodstream. And, you uh-huh. know, and then we start educating them about that as well. But, um, it's, it's, it is here. We've, um, we've got people that, you know, I feel like the majority of the Tennesseans a hundred percent support cannabis uh, legalization, at least in medicinal form. Um, and I think if we got to that, we could, we could ease it into recreational over a couple of years, like other States have. Uh, but if they don't let the tenant, if we don't, if we don't have a, a vote, you know, as individual voters, I don't, I don't think we're going to make any headway until we get some new representatives. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, you mentioned there, you know, those representatives being kind of old, send their ways and um, you know, not budging but you know that being said tennessee um you know speaking to harold and speaking to you off there and everything you know tennessee has done a great job of kind of setting up farmers and uh and having an eye on the agriculture side why do you think that is that it's it's you know whereas um you know is it just that it's okay on one end it's uh it's bad associated with marijuana but when we're talking about hemp okay cool we can see the um you know the benefits in terms of agriculture, I think a lot of states have kind of shot themselves in the foot, um, for lack of a better term, because uh, they want to push things through so quickly um, that they, they sneak stuff in that actually hurts farmers um, along the end um, and benefits big business and all that kind of stuff. How does that differ from Tennessee and what you guys have been doing there? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we've seen those bills all across um, in, in all different forms of cannabis reform in all different states and Tennessee, um, you know, thankfully they did, they, they, they spoke to our department of agriculture um, and they treated it hemp completely as an agricultural product. Um, the department of agriculture then reached out to the farmers and created a panel and they got together and, you know, said, Hey, what do you guys need um, for this hemp program? At the time it was still a pilot program um, to be successful and for us to make this into a, a agricultural um, you know, commodity that we can make into, you know, bring some of these farmers some of the livelihood back that, you know, as farms have went down over the years. And I think that's what set us aside is by that communication between um, the department or the, yeah, the Department of Agriculture and directly to our farmers. And they took that um, and they took it to heat and they took it right up to the guys that were writing the bills and they said, here's what we need in here to have a successful program. And um, they've backed us up 100%. Um, if we've ever had a problem, the Department of Agriculture has listened to us. They've stepped in and um, spoken on our behalf and done what they need to do to help us rectify the situation. So um, as far as that goes, we're great as far as the, the bills and who we're taking care of. Um, literally anybody in Tennessee can grow hemp for 250 bucks. Um, and that's it. And you can, you can start and you can grow your own hemp in your back yard whether it be for personal use or whether you're going to try to make a product line or, or whatever it may be and um, I love seeing that I love seeing the guys grow into 10 and 15 plants for the for the personal use and, uh-huh. and and stuff I mean that's 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 where it's at right there man that's that's where that's what I love to see um, the guys that are taking advantage not taking advantage in a bad way but taking advantage of this opportunity um, in this program and saying hey I'll be a hemp farmer and 250 bucks um, right in the middle of downtown Chattanooga they've got hemp lots in people's backyards and it's freaking cool, man. Um, it's really cool to see that happening. Um, and they're not, they're not, you know, busting anybody's balls over this. They're not saying they're not coming out and, and treating them bad and, and harassing them or anything like that. They're, they're letting them do their thing. And it's been really cool to see that, especially when we see other States getting treated so badly, um, in their, their reforms and their bills. Yeah. I mean, that is, uh, that is a huge advantage. You know, you see there's still a couple of states where, uh, you know, literally the only thing you can have is CBD isolate. And, uh, and then, you know, then you go from there to the spectrum, you know, being able to grow, what can you grow, um, you know, having that. And, you know, it's all just trying to control the plant and um, wanting to, you know, control the money and, and everything else that goes along with it, right? I mean, there's a lot of power with being able to grow uh, in your backyard for your own personal use. 
that I think um, they don't want to give up that kind of power. You know, it's, uh, it's that's what it really boils down to all the times. Um, so, um, you know, you mentioned they're local. Um, and, and obviously across the country, we talk about local, buying local, the need to buy local, why wouldn't you support local, why wouldn't you support small businesses. Um, and here, like you said, you know, you carry pretty much almost exclusively Tennessee products. Um, you know, you support that and you talk about the relationships there. Is that something that you just like, uh, if you were in, you know, Texas, would you still, you know, only have Texas stuff? And the fact that you're in Tennessee, you have Texas or, is uh, it some, or you know, Tennessee, you have Tennessee or, um, or, or do you see the value there? I do. I, I do a hundred percent see that value, um, wherever you're at. I mean, if that's where you lay roots at, um, I, I think that's what you should do. I think you should support your local community, um, wherever you are. And if you were in Texas or, or in, you know, Kentucky or any of these States, and we have some amazing bordering States that have, I mean, phenomenal products mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I just look at my Tennessee farmers and I say, Hey man, we need to catch up with these guys, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's no disrespect, no disrespect to any of the other companies from other States. I, it's just something that when me and my wife shop for anybody, we go and buy something local. You know, if you get a present from us, it's going to be something from, from somebody that made it here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's what we wanted to, to bring to the table here. The other thing is, um, that I think about supporting local. If somebody comes in, and wants to know something, you know, we can hop on the phone and call them. We can schedule days where these farmers come in here and hang out in the shop and you can come in and do meet and greets and people like that. Um, I think with everything that's going on right now, uh, more than ever, people are really tuning into um, where their consumable products are coming from, whether it be corn, tomatoes, CBD products, yeah. tea, whatever yeah. it is you're consuming and putting your body, people are becoming more and more aware of the origins the ingredients and things like that. And I feel like so by being completely local, you have a lot more, maybe not control in that, but you, you know, you got a lot more know-how. Um, we, we go, I, I literally drive to these farms across Tennessee and pick my products up just to, to visit with them and, and say, Hey, and see what's going on. And I mean, that's the, that's some of the, the best parts of my job is going and meeting these guys. And if I was buying products from Texas and California and all over the place, I man, I would be run ragged and and broke trying to um, go out and visit these facilities and hang out with these people. Um, and we, we, you know, if we were in, in Texas, we would 100% support the local community that we were in there. I um, mean, I think that's huge across the nation. I think that's what's going to bring us all together and uh, pick us up out of this uh, weird spots that we're in right now. Three, two, one, zero, ignition, lift off. We at Calican are passionate about cannabis and CBD marketing, branding, SEO content, and web design. If you are a cannabis owner and you know you need an uptick in business or an upgrade in the way your customers perceive you, come check us out at Calican.com and schedule a time to speak with us today. Definitely. And, you know, that's kind of the transition that we're looking at. You know, you mentioned how people are so aware of what they put in their bodies in terms of food, right? In terms of everything, right? And, and hemp's kind of going that way towards big ag. And uh, that's kind of the future of it as well. You know, we talk about, you know, the cannabinoids kind of being opening the door for everything else. But, uh, you know, it's not the be all end all. Obviously, there's, a lot, you know, you have the hemp house, right? It's not the CBD house, you know, it's uh, that's true. Hemp, hemp has, uh, you know, so much power. Um, that, you know, we kind of look at, uh, and even when we say CBD, you know, we talk about cannabinoids in general, you know, like you said, the CBG, the CBN, um, you know, it's just kind of like a catch all term that, that I think uh, in the future, it's, it's going to be something that, um, you know, you know, we were talking about off air, you know, um, you know, the, the need for, um, you know, for hemp cream, everything else that's going on. And that's, that's something that we've, uh, touched on a little bit here. Um, but yeah, you know, I love, I love the way that you supporting local and how important that is i think that that's uh that's something that uh, that we all need you know to uh whenever possible obviously yeah absolutely um and our customers appreciate it i mean that's the that's the cool we wouldn't do it if our customers didn't you know respond so positively to that um they know that when they come in here you know when we speak about who we bought it from it's going to be oh we bought that from harold you know it's not oh the this company out in tennessee it's, it's harold we bought it you know we bought it from him and his wife and yeah um you know for the other farmers it's, it's all first name basis and I, I think our customers they just they appreciate that and um and it's been received very well that's great that's great now uh, you know transitioning a little bit to the hemp house you know something else that we talked about off there you know you, we, we talked about obviously 
school and, and, you know, ADHD and everything like this, but something, you know, is, uh, if I'm not wrong, you, you dropped out of school in 10th grade, correct? And, uh, um, I did. Um, yeah. and, uh, I don't, don't come from any, any crazy cool background. Um, you know, no, no money, no, no financial background, no big biz businessman history. Uh, my dad worked in a carpet mill. Um, and yeah, I quit school at 16 to, uh, uh do construction. Um, and kind of did that up until the point of opening Hemp House in 2017. Um, of course, during all that time, always supporting cannabis, attending events, uh, normal, things like that, um, in all the ways that I could, uh, but was always blocked by any progression due to our walls. So um, the minute that we saw the opportunity for that, um, we, uh, you know, thankfully I have an awesome wife. She uh, supported me as I quit my construction job and went and opened a retail shop, which is, you know, <laughs> nothing I'd ever done in my life. So um, definitely a, a huge, very fast learning curve um, for me. And I mean, you know, two and a half years in and we're still learning um, a lot um, all the time. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been interesting, but it does let everybody know. I mean, you don't have to come from, from, from anything magnificent to, uh, to be a business owner, a small business owner at that. Um, we, you know, we jumped in with our feet run and took a huge risk that's paid off tremendously. Um, but yeah, I have no formal education. I've, 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 I got my GED the month after I quit school and that was where my education stopped um, other than uh, hanging out with some rough people on the street. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. And the reason I bring that up is not to put you on blast, you know, obviously not. The reason I bring it up is because yeah. like, you, like you touched on there, you know, I think we look at, you know, now it's 2020, but you know, even a couple of years ago, years ago you know we're looking at cannabis as the green rush you know and the green rush who was rushing in it was you know people in finance people from from other businesses from other sectors who saw quote the opportunity you know the market opportunity um and uh, and this was kind of the thing you know and we look at people we we i think it's uh we we look at the industry as a whole as something that you know you need a lot of money to get in um you need to be able to have a lot of backing um, you know, experience and this, that, the other thing, and, um, you know, business experience, everything else. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. And we're kind of seeing in practice, it's, it's not like that. And, and I think you are a testament to that, you know, and I think that that's valuable to share, um, you know, even though right now we're dealing with obviously, you know, COVID-19 and, uh, you know, in a lockdown and, and how that's been troubling to the economy, obviously, and uh, it's out of our hands, obviously, in, in so many ways. Um, it is what it is, and we have to, uh, you know, everybody has their own view on it, but, you know, we have to, uh, you know, protect the, protect people and everything like that. So, but, but to your point, like I said, it's, uh, it's not just something that you have to have experience in, you know, business or have all this backing. How have you been able to talk about kind of that transition, you know, and becoming a business owner? And now you have three stores, like, you know, it's not a small thing, right? I mean, you're successful and it's all done there locally, you know, supported by your own community and, and things like that. You know, I think we, we look at everybody wants to have this gigantic big brand um, and we forget about, you know what, I can have, make a hell of a good living um, doing this and uh, being happy, you know, and not having to, to do, uh, you know, having uh, the big backing, everything like that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, where I'm specifically at in Chattanooga is amazing. Um, we have one of the best local chamber of commerce. Um, and so that's where I went, man. I started attending, um, you know, breakfast and coffee meetings with all these business owners um, who were just, you know, letting us ask questions, kind of a, not necessarily a mentorship, but kind of, you know, you, it, was, it was all walks of life. Anybody could, could attend these. It was, uh, in, it was trying to start a business and some of them were, you know, had many businesses and, um, and those things right there were really the, the, the local community is what helped me. And so that's where I felt like, you know, giving back by keeping it all local. Um, it's, um, we're here in Chattanooga, we've got that strong sense. We have a lot of local businesses, um, a lot of support from our local community, a big artist community. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really a great place to be, but yeah, I mean, we, we reached out to our local resources, um, and, and just, you know, asked a lot of questions, <laughs> tried to figure a lot of things. Um, we, you know, a lot of things we found out the hard way. Um, and those are sometimes the best lessons learned. Um, probably could have did a few things a little bit cheaper. Um, but hey, man, it's, it's, it's all a learning curve. And it's been a blast. I'm literally doing what I love and living my dream. I mean, 
you know, when I quit school to, to work at construction, that wasn't my, my, my vision. You know, I, I knew I was going to be somewhere in this industry along the way. Um, and I, I, I'm, I couldn't be happier to have landed in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, and, and be able to start this business. And yeah, we, we're a couple of years in and three stores strong. Um, today, I actually, due to the uh, COVID-19, we're actually about to reopen to the public today and allow nice. um, some of our customers back in. Um, we adapted to this by offering local delivery, and um, we basically would deliver to anybody in our county. Um, and that was a huge hit and was what really kept us alive during this time that we've been shut down because our customers have continued to support us through this. And, um, and, and we've, uh, we've done quite, we've, we've been good during this. So I think we're going to be okay. And I think that all comes down to uh, being involved in a local community, um, you know, shopping and supporting local, having local products, attending local events. I mean, that's, that's what I think it's all about. And in those times of need, they step up and, um, and, and help you. And those, you know, we go back to the, the, the autism community. Um, they, they were one of the bet, the first ones to go out and say, Hey, you know, all these fundraisers we did were done by small businesses. Here's the small business that supported us. Now we need y'all to go support them. And so that's the kind of stuff that we saw here in Chattanooga. And I mean, that was, that was awesome, you know, to, to see these, these nonprofits come out and say, Hey, these guys supported us throughout the years and now they need us. And, and I think it helped because um, we, 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 we saw a little slow time, but man, it, it steadied right along and we were able to, to stay fast and, and move forward. So, um, our, I think the local community is where it's at in all aspects. I know, definitely. And I think, you know, you talk about their being able to transition, you know, not transition, but being able to adapt, obviously, you know, on, on the fly. I think uh, that was uh, something that a lot of people have either done really well or not done very well. And um, the ones who weren't able to really adapt um, like that uh, have, have really seen a big hit in there. You know, everybody's seen a hit in one way or another, I guess. But, um, but you know, Talk to me about that, you know, was obviously you have your local clientele, you know, you have people that are already there loyal to Hemp House and they come in. Was it something that, you know, now that you guys are doing local delivery, um, first and foremost, was that something that people were like, oh, hell yeah, this is awesome. You know, this is even better. Um, is that something you guys are going to continue to do? And was it something that you guys, um, you know, were getting by, by people calling in, calling you, or uh, was it something that you were us utilizing your e-commerce? Um, and uh, how are you able to, to transition so seamlessly there with that? Um, it was just, yeah, we were here every day answering the phones, um, putting social media up, um, putting out newsletters, letting everybody know, hey, you know, we'll, we'll bring it to you. Don't, don't, you know, and a lot of, you know, you're never going to make everybody happy. Uh, but for the most part, we got uh, continuous support through this. And um, I think people are going to continue to take advantage of the local delivery. It's something we're going to continue to do it um, as long as our customers are, are using it. Um, we don't mind at all. We've been able to adapt it into our workload. So it's, it's, it's going to work out great for us. And if we're you know, helping our customers out, whether they want to stay home, for whatever reason, or maybe they're just too busy and can't swing by and delivery is the best option for them. We're here to do that. Um, this has been a new avenue that's opened up for us. So um, I think we're going to kind of uh, definitely keep it in place and see how we can use it to our best advantage to um, reach more of our customers on a personal level and um, just build those relationships that are going to continue to help us flourish through, um, through whatever you know times we may have. Um, and of course, you know, we're going to stay open. So if, if you want to come in, you can, um, if not, you know, we respect that and we will absolutely bring it to your house, knock on your door. We'll leave it on the porch, whatever, you know, we're, we're pretty accommodating right now. Um, and we're just happy and thankful for our customer support. So, um, we're going to continue to do what needs to be done for them. Um, that's what we open the place for, you know, it, it's, it's, it's never been a, a money grab or anything like that. This was a hundred percent open to help our community to bring awareness to cannabis um, and to kind of remove that stigma. And that's, you know, that's what we, we aim to do. So um, that's where we're at. Oh, very, very good. So, um, so it was really like kind of like all hands on deck uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being on the phone more, um, you know, it's, uh, wow, it seems uh, taking all out there, supporting your, your community and your community supporting you as well. That's awesome. Now with everything, you know, I mean, we talked about your story, um, starting a business, coming from, not from a business background, um, you know, and obviously, uh, you know, but local and, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously being hit 
from the COVID-19. What's been overall your biggest struggle, your big obstacle with Hemp House um, in general, um, whether it be past or recently, and how you've been able to overcome that? Um, I think our, our, our biggest struggle has just been reaching our community members that we're unable to reach. You know, that's, that's what I, I was, we were having brunch uh, yesterday morning at, a, um, at a, a business that is literally less than a mile from one of my shops. And the guy saw my hat and said, oh, uh, you work at Hemp House? And I said, yeah. He said, well, what is that? I, you know, I've never heard of it. And, you know, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, wait a minute, we're, you know, two years in, how have you not heard of me? And, or heard of Hemp House, what we're doing? <laughs> Um, and so it, it, you know, that's the struggle that I'm constantly running up against is, all right, how, where's this demographic at that we're not reaching and how do we get, to it? um, if you know about us and you just say, Hey, CBD is not for me, that's fine. But I at least want to reach more people so that we are, are touching as many people as we can and they're and bringing that awareness out there. Um, and that's, that's kind of been our biggest thing. Um, we were, I, I walked right up to our, um, uh, chief of police when we opened, shook his hand and said, Hey man, here's what I'm doing. Here's who I am. Um, would love it if you guys want to come by the shop and within four days they were at my shop yeah. um, and we've actually had customers come from the police force um, our police officers that are our customers and that's been super awesome um, they you know first responders have some of the most stressful yeah. jobs out there so yeah. who could benefit more from a, a good dose of CBD and who wouldn't want to deal with somebody in those settings that's more you know calm down and relaxed and not as on edge as, as normal so um, that's been great. And then there, you know, and then of course we've got tons of them that, you know, don't want to go down that route and we can still talk about these a topical or something. So reaching these demographics that, that are, don't know we're here or even better are opposed to us. Um, that's been my biggest struggle and kind of what my biggest passion is. Um, and that's, that's what we want to keep on doing um, is reaching out to the people that, that are you know still not aware of what, what we're doing out here. Yeah, I know. Definitely. And I can, you know, uh, that can definitely be frustrating right there. And you're like, what the hell? You haven't even heard of Hemp House? Like, yeah, right yeah. like, what do you mean? Like, you haven't heard the controversy this within that? But yeah, you know, you also mentioned their first responders and, and police officers. And, uh, and you know, we covered that, obviously, you know, the episode with Ernie Beck. He was a first responder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talking about that these are the people who need it the most, actually, right? And, and how, I agree. you know, okay, we get it. Like, stringent. First of all, the stigmas there, right? Just in general. Um, you know, having to do with cannabis, it falls under the same category, right? You know, whether it's hemp, marijuana side, THC side, you know, it's, it has to do with, you know, this cannabis, this, this umbrella that people just like don't, can't wrap their head around in, in one state. But in the other end, you know, the fact of the matter is they have really stringent text, testing um, and they can't, they can't risk putting it, right? So the importance of THC free, non-detectable THC, um, you know, all, all that as well. I mean, it's really important because these people are the ones who have the most stress and, you know, often dealing with PTSD and dealing with a lot of things. And, um, you know, it's okay for people to go home and have a drink, you know, or, or medicate in other forms or get, you know, prescription medication, everything like that. Um, but a lot of times the people, you know, these people um, even adverse to, to therapy or other kinds of forms as well. You know, there's a lot of stigma in all kinds of different ways because we're talking about people who are you know, supposed to be the toughest people in the community and uh, you know they uh, they're supposed to suck it up and, and keep going when really they're the ones who who need support, obviously. Right? Agree. Um, so yeah. Agree. So, uh, so big shout out to all the first responders for sure, because they are. Yeah. I mean, they're doing a job that none of, none of us are doing. You know. Yeah. Um, and that's that's something that we you know we always offer a, a discount to all of our first responders, and and like you said, they that's the biggest thing is they want to know where their products came from. They want to see the COAs. They want to know that there's non-detectable THC in there for these tests because you don't want to add any stress to what they're already doing. So um, that's something that we provide. That's something that we, we do um, and that we work with them and explain, you know, how certain products are, are deemed safe and some might, you know, might be a little bit more risky and they're always super appreciative of that. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we're here for the education part of it for yeah. sure. Um, and we see that in all aspects from uh, all different, uh, all different occupations. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, you know, education is always a thing in the industry and, you know, and having that advantage of being able to have the store and talk to people in person and at the same time, it's like, um, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, having to be on the phones and do local deliveries and still not reaching everybody. I mean, what's the plan there, I guess, you know, because there's only one Dwayne and I'm sure you have all hands on deck, like I said, and then other people, you know, employees, everything helping you out. But what's, you know, overcoming those struggles, right, of, of uh, you know, having um, 
that awareness, that, that awareness of hand palace and what you guys are doing and uh, being able to educate more people and to bring poor people in. What's, what's the plan with that? I think as the, uh, as our, as Chattanooga begins to come back from the COVID-19 and business start to become more open. Um, I think my plan is to be more involved, um, just be more involved with everything that's going on, um, on, on every level possible, whether it be helping another business owner get his stuff back open, whether it be just attending meetings and giving input on ways to do improvement, things like that. But I want to be more out there so that when, when people see me or they see our logo, um, they recognize us as that, as someone who's in the community and, and doing things. And then hopefully that will engage them to, uh, to reach back to us and say, hey, what's Hemp House about? And then we can kind of reach out there and, and make that new relationship with either a customer, or maybe a, another hemp farmer or either another businessman or woman that's, uh, that's trying to move forward in Chattanooga. Uh, I didn't have all the help I needed, so I would love to be a resource to other people um, that are in similar or same situations as what I found myself in a few years ago. Um, and so I think just being out there, being involved and being present is the best way um, to, to be known and be seen. I mean, obviously, we'll, we'll look at amping up some uh, advertising and stuff, but that's the easy stuff. You know, that's 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 the easy stuff to do. Just put more ads out. Uh, but I think getting out there and, and, and shaking hands and seeing people and, and, and tell them what hemp and hemp house is about is, is the best way to do it. Amazing. Amazing. Definitely. You know, it's, it is important. We live in a time right now. It's. Uh, you know, we're not sure when that's going to be. So, uh, you know, it is, it is difficult, you know, even talking about sports, everything's continuing to be shut down for a while. It's, it looks so it's, uh, but we're definitely looking forward to getting back out there. I know, you know, you guys have a store at least, you know, and, uh, you know, have you come supporting you. I know there's a lot of people out there who their main thing was, uh, farmers markets, you know, and they yeah. have the storefront and they've been hit tremendously hard and, and not just in, in hand policy in, in all regards, yeah. um, every sector as well. Um, so yeah, a couple of our, a couple of our vendors make their living doing the the markets. I mean, we 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 have a lot of open air markets here in the Chattanooga and surrounding areas, and a lot of them are, are they travel to these markets every weekend, and that's really where they make their their their, their money at. And um, all that's still still on hold here. And when it um, does open up, there's a lot of guidelines and restrictions to uh, to being in there and attending those events. So. Um, I think a, a lot of people are just going to, you know, we're, we're all going to have to work together to help each other and um, support each other. I think that's the biggest part is supporting each other, um, whether it's buying that lotion you've been thinking about for a couple of months, you know, or whatever it might be to help out that, that vendor that's, that's struggling right now. Um, I think that's, that's, where, that's the only way that I see us coming out of this is, is coming together, um, reaching out, asking your neighbor what they need, what you can do for them. And following through with it, you know, and um, and being supportive of those that need it the most. No, definitely, definitely, very, very good. So, uh, what can we expect from Hemp House in the future? I mean, I know you talked about opening back up. Do you guys have plans? Um, I know you talked about supporting, you know, continuing to support Tennessee brands and everything like that. Um, and you guys are expanded to three stores. Any more plans coming down the coming down the pipeline? Um, nothing, nothing major. Uh, we, we just opened our most recent store in November and had a grand opening in March, a week before our shutdown. So, uh, we were lucky to get that in. Um, and so we're just looking forward to, to getting back out there, being involved in our community, seeing what kind of events can happen that we can be a part of. Um, and, and just, you know, being involved and, and being seen, uh, we're looking forward to our customers. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an extrovert. So this, uh, non-interaction thing has really had me kind of, uh, on, on a, pins and needles. Um, I have to have that uh, communication with people. Um, so I'm looking forward to having our customers back in the shop, um, hearing about what they've been doing, hearing about, you know, how they've been dealing with this um, and, and figuring out, you know, like what, what, what we can all do to, to move forward and get this moving back to, to where things are semi-normal and we've got sports and we've got open air markets and we've got these events, um, you know, moving forward. That's what, that's what we're looking forward to. And then um, obviously growth with our, our hemp industry, you know, as the Tennessee uh -huh. hemp industry continues to grow, um, we want to be right there with that, whether it be including new farmers and new products in our stores or helping uh, orchestrate some more things that are going on in Tennessee. Uh, we had a couple of great um, hemp cups and hemp festivals going on. So I know a lot of people are looking forward to uh, getting back to those things. And um, that's where that's where Hemp House will be at. It's um, out in our community, um, just uh, trying to support everybody and be seen and uh, help out where we can. Exactly, man. Along the same lines, you know, we talk about it, you know, the need to support your local community. And like you said, being that expert, being out there. And I'm kind of the same way, right? You know, luckily, uh, 
still able to, still able to connect across the country, across the world. You know, uh, Zoom's killing it right now, you know. I yeah, they are. That, uh, <laughs> but, you know, definitely being able to, uh, you know, face-to-face, interface, so it's super important. Now, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, background and coming here and having three stores, you know, and uh, it's really, really inspiring, you know, but I always ask every entrepreneur, um, you know, every business person and definitely everybody on this, uh, on this podcast, you know, how do you define success, whether professionally, personally, existentially? What does success look like for you? Um, and that's, that's actually probably one of the toughest questions I've, I've been asked, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of people define success by monetary value. Um, you know, I, I mean, that's, that's a tough one. I think I will be successful, um, or hemp house will be successful. Um, when, you know, obviously me and my family are taken care of and the stores are running and we are reaching our community and we are just a, when we are known for the good that we can bring to a community. That's when I, that's when I know that we'll be successful. When you say hemp house and someone says, Oh yeah. And yeah. they lead off with that positive aspect of what we just did that either bettered them or their community in some direct fashion. That's how I know I'll be successful. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Awareness and, you know, having that excitement, knowing the hemp house right away instead of like, Oh, what, do you, do you work for hemp house? It's like, yeah, I'm not just the, uh, the owner, I'm also a client, you know, like the, uh, the old yeah, exactly. man commercials, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> as a matter of fact, I work there a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Very good, man. Dwayne, it's been great. You know, as we close, how can listeners find out more about Hemp House, connect with you, buy your products, um, and everything from like that? Uh, yeah, so our website is hemphousechat, that's C-H-A-T-T dot com. Um, again, you're finding all local products. We have a live chat option. If you have any question about our products, cause you may not be familiar with seeing them, um, just shoot us a message and we'll respond to you immediately. And if you're ever in the Chattanooga area, we've got three locations. We'd love for somebody to stop by and say, Hey man, we heard about you on Maynard's podcast. And, um, and you know, we'll definitely take care of them for that for sure. Dwayne, it's been amazing. I'm going to link all that stuff here in the descriptions. And, uh, Dwayne, it's been a pleasure, man. Very inspiring, very good stuff. And, um, you know, wish you nothing but the best, you know, so thanks again for jumping on with me. Thanks everybody for listening today. Um, and uh, good luck to you in the rest of 2020 and beyond. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for listening to Dank Discussions. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave a review. We want to continue making dank content you want to hear, so give us some feedback about the topics you want covered. Feel free to reach out to us at grow at calican.com. That's G-R-O-W at C-A-L-A-C-A-N-N dot com. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter for our latest updates.